Well, I'm here to talk about the progression uh, and what to do about it. Um, uh, here are a few key terms that I'm going to run through. Um, what I thought I'd, first of all, is um, answer sort of a very good question earlier on about if we've got all these treatments presented by David Miller for relapsing and remitting MS, uh, why haven't we got treatments for progressive MS? And I think the first thing we have to do is talk about what is progressive MS, what do we mean by progression. So I'm going to try and do that. I'm certainly going to confuse myself. I might confuse you as well. Um, and then I'm going to hopefully give you the answer of what we should do. Okay, so um, you've seen this already today. As clinicians, we need to organise our thoughts about MS and we need to structure or categorise it so we could define it and understand the disease. So I think you have to understand that these um, categories that uh, we use are man-made, so they don't perfectly fit the biological model. But the categories we've developed are relapsing remitting MS, and these people have attacks and then recovery. Sometimes the recovery is not always complete. But this is due to the inflammatory process, we believe, where you have damage to cells, and that you can either have a complete recovery or you can leave damage to the cells. So it's an incremental process, and it's thought to be driven basically by inflammation. And this is these white cells, which for some reason are attacking our own tissue. Now, most patients present with relapsed remission MS, and then maybe 10 years later, they enter what we call the secondary progressive phase of the disease. And this is where we start to see these linear changes here. And it's felt to be a gradual onset, an accumulation of damage. It might be linear, or it might plateau. And it doesn't necessarily go at the same rate, so it can speed up, slow down. And you can still have relapses as you go along with that. So you can actually have a combination of this gradual loss of cells, but also the inflammatory process at the same time. Then there's the primary progressive group, and they are thought to have a purely linear pattern. But some people debate whether they are allowed relapses or not. And this is a very good example where a man-made definition doesn't really work in all patients, because biology doesn't follow our rules. And I saw another interesting blog um, comment from a patient saying, well, why do we distinguish secondary progressive and primary progressive MS when we're recruiting for trials? Surely they're the same linear process. And it's a very good point. And that's a very good example, as Gavin said, about the questions you pose to us actually make us think and are really relevant to what we're doing. So maybe we should be thinking about progressive MS as a group rather than separating them into primary and secondary progressive MS. And here's another way of looking at it. And again, I think this is the way we, as doctors and scientists, want to try and tease out the, the underlying process. But we have to actually simplify it for ourselves. Just concentrating on this rectangle here, I think the way we perceive it still is that inflammation is the majority of the process early on in relapsing and remitting MS. But as, the, as you go along over time, over the years neurodegeneration, and you've heard that word earlier, about when cells are just gradually dying off, which is a kind of natural process in the body already, as we all age. But obviously, in certain conditions, like MS, Parkinson's, dementia, motor neurone disease, we see this gradual and continual loss of cells, more rapid than is normal. So that's the secondary progressive phase. It's felt to be more in the neurodegenerative um, ballpark, as it were. And if we try and look at the um, actual process within the nerves and the neurons, um, this is a lot of work that's been led by Ken Smith, and I think we'll talk to you as well today, and explain it a lot better than me, but again, you've seen this earlier, where you have your normal axone, your nerve, which has myelin across it, myelin's like the insulation which protects that nerve, but also makes that nerve much more efficient and then you have the inflammation, the relapse, which causes a damage to the myelin. But the reason you have the recovery is because the nerve is intact. 
And that allows sodium channels to populate the remaining nerve. And therefore you have a nerve that's intact, but as Susan showed very nicely in her video of action potentials, although it's intact, it's not working as well as it used to work. And hence, the slowness of movement, the weakness, and the fatigue. But also, that demyelination also has a secondary effect, as well as the immediate functional problems, is that it means that nerve is at risk of further damage. And later on, that nerve is likely to die off, more likely than a myelinated nerve. So it's, as it were, leading to the neurodegeneration. The idea is then, again, this is another model of MS. You start here with inflammation. So the white arrows are inflammation going on. And it's likely that you're having inflammation even before you're aware of it. Interesting story yesterday, well, yeah, yeah last night I saw a patient who had gone to Preventicom. I don't know if you know about these uh, imaging sensors that do annual scans for people to screen out any disease. And basically, she's completely well, and she went to Preventicom, and she's got three lesions, one of which is enhancing. And the year before she went there, she had a normal scan. So she's got what we call radiologically isolated disease, which is syndrome, which is here. So she doesn't have any symptoms, but she's got active lesions. Then, at some stage, you will have a clinical event where the inflammation breaks through and you become aware of it. And you continue having this inflammation on the MRI scan, which, as David Miller shows, is actually more common on the MRI scan than the patient is aware of it. But the real question about progression, which starts developing years later, is it related to this inflammation? Or is this a process that starts back here and only becomes relevant here because it's, in, it's sort of subclinical before that? And I think that's one of our problems, our first problems about what to do about progression, is although we understand we see it later on in the disease, we're not quite sure about what's really driving it and what starts it off. I think it's even appealing in some ways to say that this process may be independent, may be going on all the time, or is the inflammation actually causing the progression? And I'm going to show you evidence either way and then dodge the answer at the end. <laughs> so, some very important work done by David Miller's group at uh, the National, and this will probably never be repeated again, is taking patients when they first present with their clinically isolated syndrome, and then monitoring how their natural history is of the disease and their MRI. And what this graph showed here is that the patients who end up as secondary progressive here at 20 years compared to those who have relapsed and remitting disease at 20 years, they have more and more of these lesions on the MRI scan called T2 lesions. And these are markers of inflammation. So you could then take this as good evidence that inflammation obviously leads on to secondary progressive disease. So that inflammation, that damage to the nerves, which weakens the nerves, means that you end up with neurodegeneration and losing nerve cells. However, of course, the French beg to differ. And this is the Edan and Confravo uh, epidemiology studies, which show that actually your rate of progression, and they class that as going from EDSS3, which remember, EDS3 S3 is a score where you're fully ambulatory, but you do have some stiffness and weakness and poor balance, to EDSS6, where you're using a walking stick, and that's on that side there, over time, is actually pretty much similar in these three groups. And these three groups are categorised by how active and fast their disease is early on. So what Confravo is suggesting is actually the progressive phase of the disease is completely separate to the initial phase of the disease. And it's independent of how many inflammatory lesions you have and how much disease activity you have 
And once you enter that progressive phase, it progresses independently of your previous history. Hence, that's the alternative to saying it's related to inflammation. Now, this is the end product of progression. And this is the brain atrophy that we see in MS. And this is a loss of tissue. And again, I think a lot of us feel this is predominantly due to neurodegeneration rather than inflammation. And this is obviously what we're going to try to prevent by treating progressive disease and stopping neurodegeneration. So how about brain atrophy and measuring brain atrophy? So these graphs show how much atrophy is per year. And it's interesting that even in these patients, clinically isolated syndrome patients, maybe even the patient with radiologically isolated syndrome that I saw last night, who isn't even aware that she has any symptoms of MS, but a scan shows it, these patients early on have increased rates of brain atrophy than the normal population. And this seems to be pretty consistent across all the different groups. The early stage of relapsed remitting, the secondary progressive stage. So they're all about 0.4, which is above the average of brain atrophy for the normal population. So this atrophy does seem to be going on early on. So again, maybe neurodegeneration starts very early on in MS, rather than being considered a late process. Okay, so as ever, all the scientists have different stories and different arguments for uh, their theories and stand by them. And it's difficult for the clinician, the simple clinician like me, of who to believe. So let's, um, as it were, skip round the Monopoly board and let's try and see what happens when we give treatments and see if that gives us the answer. And I was very hopeful that... Alemtuzumab, as we heard earlier, one of the big um, sort of game changers we hoped has been very strongly anti-inflammatory and having very strong effects on the disease activity, even compared to interferon. Well, would that really teach us that if you could suppress inflammation completely, that then you're going to stop progression? And I show this slide for two reasons. One, disappointingly, in the alemtizumab trial, that alemtizumab, over 24, year, uh, 24 months, the amount of people who progressed was about 8%. And that was compared to interferon, which you accept is a much less effective anti-inflammatory, at about 11%. So there was a slight improvement, but actually it wasn't significantly different. And then that makes you concerned that maybe stopping the inflammatory process doesn't stop the progression. And in particular to say that patients still do progress on alemtuzumab. Now, there's lots of holes in that argument you can pick. Um, one of the first is the other reason I've chosen this slide is that in some ways, I think, again, for the clinician, the easy opt-out is to say, well, actually, we're not sure what we're measuring, whether we're measuring relapses or whether we're measuring progression. And, you know, how pure should we be about the terms? Because really what matters and what matters to the patient is about sustained accumulation of disability. And that's actually, I think, a really important point, that we want to actually just stop the accumulation of disability. We'll leave it to David to worry about whether it's progression or inflammatory, but what we really want to do is find a drug that can stop people getting worse. So, from this, you would suggest that uh, stopping the inflammation doesn't seem to have much impact on the progression. But, <laughs> this is another study. And this is a study done um, in primary progressive patients. And this demonstrates a therapeutic lag where patients starting off here with primary progressive MS with no treatment for a couple of years, their progression was monitored. And then for a couple of years, they were given interferon. And again, I've already said that interferon has some anti-inflammatory effect. We certainly think it has very little in the way of neuroprotective effect. And the study was 
probably as most people would expect, not successful in that given interferons didn't seem to stop the progression of the disease in the two years of the study. However, when they carried on monitoring them for a further two years, the group that were actively treated with interferon, the blue group here, their disease did seem to slow down. So it did seem that stopping the inflammation here did seem to slow down the progression a few years later. Perhaps an argument, therefore, that maybe we've been measuring the wrong thing in our studies. Um, someone was making a point that we want to shorten our studies. Well, by shortening our studies, we may be missing important effects that later on we see progression being slowed down by a drug we thought wasn't effective. Clinicians are pretty impatient people, I think. You know, we like an immediate effect. We like to see our patients get better. And hence, dynamic men like Jeremy Chataway said, I'm not going to wait for the scientists to tell me about progression. I'm going to get a drug called statin, and I'm going to give it to patients with secondary progressive MS. And he has to be congratulated on that, because by giving a trial in statins, a drug which, as was alluded to, we're not really quite sure what its effect is, but we thought it might have some anti-inflammatory effect at least. He's demonstrated here that by giving statins, you reduce the change in brain volume, the atrophy, from something like 0.5 or 0.6 to 0.3%, so almost halving it. And he showed that successfully in the MS stat trial of simvastatin in secondary progressive MS. So by stopping that brain atrophy and that loss of tissue, hopefully protecting patients against further disability. I think another approach, and Raj will correct me, but Raj Kapoor and I think Ken Smith and David Miller thought another approach is to try and stabilise those neurons that have lost those myelin uh, insulation. And by giving lamotrigine, which is another anti-epileptic, anti -epileptic, like you heard about phenytoin and oxcarbazepine, by giving lamotrigine, you might stabilise those cells and you might improve their survival. And in that way, you may actually stop some of the neurodegeneration. And again, it, this published in The Lancet some four years ago shows that Again, lamotrigine, as it were, slows down the loss of cerebral volume compared to the placebo there. Okay? So it does have some beneficial effect. Just to interject at this point, while we're talking about studies, one of the other big considerations about studies, as well as length, whether they're too long or too short, is also about what patients we should be studying. In that... Traditionally, we as clinicians use walking as the marker and we decide that people are eligible for studies if they're still mobile and um, we can use that as a measurement. But of course, something we need to think about now as we're much more sort of open-minded is actually the motor system does tend to go early on in the progressive of MS. And there's this asynchronous map that we've got here that we mustn't forget that all these other functions, balance, sensory, upper limbs, cognition, vision, which are of, often are affected later on in the disease, are targets that we can also measure for looking for the benefits of drugs. So going back to what I was saying earlier about including patients in trials, as well as patients putting themselves forward, I think us as clinicians also need to design trials which are more inclusive for people who aren't uh, just fully mobile, that can be coming along and having benefits for upper limb, vision, and cognitive function. So, I hope I've sort of bamboozled you now about whether what progression is, but maybe you might see what our dilemma is, in that we're not sure ourselves, and therefore we may look like we're um, scrabbling around, but there's a good reason for that, because like you, we're impatient about trying to improve things. So rather than waiting for David to give me the correct answer, we're going to go ahead and do a few more trials. And this is really where we're up to at UCLP. So again, just to remind you that we're looking at um, radiologically isolated syndromes, and we are picking this up more often with incidental scans. Clinically isolated syndromes, so this is patients who've had the one episode but have been 
um, having MRI markers that they will have future attacks, making them relapsing and remitting MS. And then we've got relapsing or early SPMS, this sort of overlap, and then secondary progressive MS, and as the blogger suggested, lumping it together with primary progressive MS. And the theory is that here you have subclinical disease, you've got a little bit of inflammation. As the inflammation becomes higher and higher, you've got the relapsing remitting process, but that inflammation goes down over time, and during that time you've got cell loss. I think one of the debates is about how much it is early on and how much is later on. You've got relapses happening at this stage, and all of this time on your MRI scan, you've got relapses or inflammation going on that is more frequent than the patient is aware of. So where are we at? Well, we're doing a CIS study in phenytoin, and I think that's the one fully recruited. We've got multiple relapse and remitting MS studies, and we've got new drugs being developed. I think really what this talk is about is to promote the next stage. There are some people who say we've cracked relapse and remitting MS. We've got 10 drugs now. If we find the right drug for individuals, we can suppress that inflammatory activity. We don't know about secondary progressive MS. So this is why we'd encourage you all to um, be active and if it's appropriate for you, consider entering some of these studies. So the Proxima study is oxcarbazepine, which again is anti-epileptic to stabilise the nerve. And this is also using a novel marker of um, taking um, CSF, lumbar puncture, uh, taking fluid that surrounds the brain and looking at something called neurofilaments, which are a marker of perhaps neurodegeneration. And perhaps from this study, as well as finding a treatment that helps patients, we may also find a marker which will enable us to predict whether patients are entering the secondary progressive phase. And then for... Um, SPMS, I'm not sure I'd use the word late, but for SPMS, there's SMART study. Now, this is using several drugs um, with interesting mechanisms of action. Um, one is a sort of diuretic, one is used in asthma, and one is used in motor neuron disease. That works on glutamate, and the other two on channels, like the other drugs as well. So, potentially, you'd be randomised to those three drugs, and it would be seen how you... Uh, respond to those uh, medications. There are some other trials of secondary progressive MS. These are commercial trials led by drug companies. Natalizumab is recruited, Siponimod, and we are about to have a Tecfidera or dimethyl fumarate trial in secondary progressive MS. So there are already some drugs which are used in relapsing remitting MS, which we're also going to use in secondary progressive MS. And again, in primary progressive MS, We've got several ongoing studies which are now recruited. So, taking the question earlier about why aren't we treating relaps um, progressive MS as we are relapsing remitting MS, I think it's because for a long time we haven't quite understood what the process is. But I think we have a slightly better understanding. We have a few more ideas. But also I think we now realise that it's worth trying the drugs that have been successful in relapsing remitting MS and let's see if they can help with progressive MS and enable us to make an impact on that disease. Thank you. Thank you.